In this video, we're going to talk about what methodology really is when it comes to research. I'm aiming at this at the master's level, so there's some things that you might read in textbook which go into more detail, and that may be because it's for maybe PhD level or above. So just bear in mind that you might find some alternative information in this video, but it should be appropriate for producing a master's dissertation. So firstly, why would you bother with a proper methodology? Well, you are on a Master of Science course. That means that you're meant to have a focus on logic, numbers, and critical thinking, the science. Now, numbers is quite a relative topic because when I say numbers, most people think, ah, oh, statistics. Not necessarily. Qualitative also includes numbers. You can have um, a, maybe 10 interviews and you're looking for key themes running between the participants. You're looking for how often those themes occur for each group and how intense they are. So there is a numerical side to the qualitative. So just very important to be important about that. And the difference on that about numbers in qualitative is it's about being rigorous. It's about having a large enough sample to say that your results are generalizable to a larger population and knowing that what you say can be backed up and quantify how people are saying. And that is different to maybe an MA approach where you might take a small sample size which is not generalizable, maybe three or four people. So that's where the numbers is. Very important to understand what the numbers mean. It doesn't necessarily mean stats. But also you've got the science part. So I go deeper into the science. So critical and rational investigation into the nature of reality. What does that mean? What it means is you are seeing what is really happening. So for example, I've got a website and I've got a layout of buttons. It doesn't really matter what layout it is, just imagine some buttons on a website. And then we say, right, I believe that we can make this better. So we analyze the layout with maybe iQuant and say, ah, there's not much tension focusing on these other areas. So let's move the buttons around or Maybe they don't look very nice. We'll make them look nicer. Whatever, we've altered the design. Now, we believe the new design is better. But is it? Well, what we can do is run an experiment. We get a certain number of people to use the first original design. And we get a certain number of people to use the redesign. And then you are comparing the two. The obvious way to do this could be in stats because it's about maybe maybe the um, measure we care about is um, reaction time, how fast people are using it or whatever, a quantitative measure. So you could get enough people, um, probably 200 is enough in this perfect world, um, and you could run a t-test between the two and see on this measure we've got such as you know, task time or errors made, whatever it is, that number two really is better. And that is different to saying, I've got a layout, tell me if you like it. Um, now, the second one saying, tell me if you like it, that's not really working out what is better and why. Um, whereas the first thing about having a maybe a t-test, that really is getting into, is this really better? It's critical. But that's not really the full story. You can go further, which is you've got to be doing something with purpose, not just making a pretty layout. You're saying, we're doing this kind of layout because. Now, it could be something as simple as because when we put the buttons in this arrangement, iQuant puts lots of attention on all of them, whereas in the original one, there's not much tension in anything. So the nature of reality part could be that when people look at all buttons, then 
the usability is better. That, that could be the idea. So you're having a purpose behind your design. So I said before, you can do qualitative. Absolutely. So um, you've got to, you could have another redesign. Let, let's say um, we're making uh, like a magic mirror in store. And we've got uh, one design producing whatever way, um, which is focusing on uh, efficiency. The whole thing's been designed to make your shopping super efficient. And the second design is designed to make everything very enjoyable, very hedonic. Remember, I spoke before about hedonic utilitarian motivation. So you've developed two magic mirrors based on a theory, you know, based on two sides of a theory. There's a hedonic one and a utilitarian one, a functional one and a one which is enjoyable. You can get people to use it, maybe a small sample size, maybe 12 people um, for each mirror. Um, could even go less, maybe let's say eight people per mirror could be okay. So we've got 16 total. And we get to use it and we can observe what they're doing. Um, we could measure things like um, task time, could measure things like errors made. Um, but what we'd really want to do is sit down with them afterwards and talk through what they felt, why they felt it, um, what they were trying to achieve, where it would work, all those kind of interviewist questions. And then you're looking to see what themes occur in the interviews. And then you say, well, are the kind of things people are saying about how they're thinking, feeling, reacting different in that really enjoyable one compared to the really functional one? Also, where are they similar? And that tells you something about how people react to magic mirrors designed for either enjoyable or function, right? So you're understanding that's something deep, right? So that's the sciencey part. You can have sciencey part qualitative. You can have sciencey part with numbers. The second part is research based. So what you're doing is you're generalizing what you found to a wider audience. Could be the UK. Could be the whole world. Now, if you want to generalize to the UK, you need so many people because you take a random sample of all the people in the UK and they represent the cross-cultural society. That's probably going to be quite a lot of people um, because society is very diverse. So we could say university students. Okay, that's a lot more generalizable. If we had 10 university students in Loughborough, I reckon their opinions are pretty similar to 10 university students in Bristol or Birmingham. But they wouldn't be generalizable to students in Shanghai necessarily. Even if you say, ah, oh, I'm going to use Chinese students. Well, the Chinese students in Shanghai probably studied in the Chinese education system. The students in the UK, they have spent at least some time in the UK education system. That might have had an influence. So you couldn't generalize um, the Chinese students. Also, China's a very large place. So that's um, again two very different. Someone who's born and raised in Shanghai might have a very different perspective than someone from the grasslands of Gansu. So you're working out who you are generalizing it to. You're trying to understand something about that group of people that helps other designers create for them. So we run this idea about magic mirrors and we do this for university students. And we work out that um, the kind of themes they're talking about on the functional one are really about satisfaction and really enjoying things and yeah we want this in our shops whereas the things about the enjoyable magic mirror it's all about it's very nice but actually i wouldn't use it so we understand the theory is that a functional magic mirror is more effective for a shop than a enjoyable magic mirror when designing for maybe 18 to 25 year old UK students all right so we've created some theory as a designer, I can take that and apply it. Um, rigorous, it's about doing things properly. So when you're um, running an interview, you're running it properly, 30, to, to 30 minutes to an hour. Um, you're recording it, you're transcribing it, running thematic analysis, maybe. Um, you're being repeatable. People know what you're doing and it's got a purpose. Um, and obviously, this is a unique product to you, so the methodology you use will be unique. 
And the better the methodology, the better the MSC part. Um, so yeah, what, what is good? Well, open, honest, and open, welcome to scrutiny. What does that mean? It means that you can write your methodology in such a clear way. I know why you're doing it. I can agree. I can disagree, but I can have a discussion about it. Let me give you an example. I'm going to run some interviews and I'm going to interview some students. Okay, well, I, I know you're doing an interview with students, but why? How many? How long? What questions? Why do you ask those questions? These are all things I'm thinking. So a good methodology would say, I'm running an interview because it's the best way to understand the complex emotions of someone using this kind of product. Interviews have been used in this study, which is comparable. It's a similar kind of study. Um, I'm going to be interviewing them in the design school for 45 minutes on average. I'll be recording and transcribing all of their interview before running thematic analysis. And then I can present a whole sheet of questions. We're going to talk about how to develop questions in a different part of the video. But when you write the detailed methodology that maybe someone else can pick up and actually run without you being there, that is great. You're giving enough detail. I agree or disagree or we can have a discussion. Um, also, good methodology is going to use the best approach. A good way to understand if your methodology is good is, can you find a journal paper that uses your approach? If you can, and it's a good paper, your methodology is probably okay. If you can't find anyone who's done anything like what you're, you're approaching or suggesting, doesn't mean you're wrong, but it's harder to just justify. So that's the kind of thing you work with your supervisor to really um, understand if your methodology is appropriate. Um, sample size, something's really important. Um, you've got to have an appropriate sample size. So if you've got statistics, go, well, what sample would I need for this thing? Now, you might be running um, categorical, which is like pass, fail, like, dislike, um, uh, finish the task, didn't finish the task, that kind of categories. For that, you use something like chi-square, where you'd need 50 people. A t-test might need 200 people, um, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, something like cap measure agreement, you can do with less. Um, it really depends what you're trying to understand. So make sure that the way you analyze data um, has the right sample size. It's completely fine using a, sm a relatively small sample size with qualitative when you're doing interviews. So maybe eight or 10 people is a good sample size for an interview. Um, but if you had eight or 10 people and try to run a t-test, it doesn't really work. We're gonna talk more about the appropriate data analysis in a bit. So just bear in mind, um, choose the right sample size for your methods. And also being critical. Now this is something called spurious correlation that I absolutely love. And it's when people look at data and look for correlation. Correlation is when one variable increases, another one increases in a similar way. So this picture, we've got the amount of mozzarella cheese people eat and the amount of engineering PhD awards given. And there's a 95.86% correlation. Super correlated. You can see it's there. Now, what does that tell us? We've got data. Does that mean that the more mozzarella you eat, the more likely you are to be a civil engineer? Probably not. It's probably another factor, which is the more people there are, the more mozzarella will be eaten. So the more civil engineers will be in some population. It's just coincidence. So be rigorous. When you've got an outcome, ask, why might this be? Don't just go, well, I've got correlation, therefore causation. Um, or I've got a difference, therefore, whatever. It can be critical. It's really think about why things are going. And when you've got good methodology, you have good science, and it prevents making mistakes. It's really important that you trust your supervisor. They are there to support you. Ask them questions. Show them your work. Even if your work is partly done, even if you've got big gaps, you don't know how to do something, show it to them. Ask them questions. Ask for their advice on where to go find the answers. 
that relationship, asking them, is super critical on developing methodology. No one is expecting you to just go away, make a methodology and hand it in. It's go away, start methodology, search a supervisor, ask for advice, work with them, go away, improve it, come back, have another discussion. Trust your supervisor, super, super important. And then in the next section, we're gonna talk about actually developing it. And that's gonna be thinking about research questions, decide how you collect your data, decide how you analyze data, and then choose the right sample size, and then define the settings. That's the way that I would approach creating a methodology. Um, there's no hard, fast rule in that. There's, you could do it in any order at some level, but that's the order we're gonna take it today, and we're gonna talk through.